Good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to the fourth day of the GEO Symposium in the session Focus on Impact Regional GEO. I will have the pleasure to facilitate this session with the assistance of Wembo Chu that will from the GEO Secretariat and Rick Bayens and all the supporting staff that will help me run this session and moderate the Slido platform. As the theme of this symposium is to help the work program activities improve their ability to implement their plans, regional geo representatives will talk about their role in user engagement, resource mobilization, as well as in scaling geo global activities to a regional level. But before getting at the heart of the session, let me first share with you an announcement done and published by the Geo Secretariat today for a call for interest that may be relevant to the regional geo and to everyone in the geo community. The call is focused on earth observation for climate change impact on world heritage cities. This call is being led by geo member Greece in collaboration with the UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. And they are looking for interest parties to provide initial support to a new community activity in the Geo Work Program. If you like more details on this initiative, please see the call for interest Earth observation for climate change impacts on world heritage cities on the Geo website and confirm your interest by the 31st of July. Let's start now our session. Uh, Rick, can you play the first slide, please? For the ones that are not familiar with regional geo, their primary function is to engage regional stakeholders in geo activities and coordinate implementation of geo activities within the region. Next slide. So I will have the pleasure to, to chair this uh, session. So I'm a policy officer at the European Commission in the Directorate General on Research and Innovation. I work more specifically in the environmental observation uh, sector, and we are uh, in charge of uh, running the Eurogeo initiative. So again, let's go back to before looking in details at our uh, session agenda of the day. Let me remind you, for the ones that are not familiar with uh, regional uh, geo, what they were, what was the rationale for their creation and the purpose uh, that were uh, their, uh, their role. So they, they were created to engage national agency, regional intergovernmental organization, and other users and potential users of Earth observation, including those having responsibility for the implementation of global and regional policy priorities. They help identify regional needs for Earth observation application and conveying this to global geo activities. They have as well to facilitate regional Earth observation activities collaboration with global activities in the geo work program. Then we think as well that they should promote communication among, among regional geo members and other participants, as well as with the other regional NGO. And why not identify funding opportunities to support regional geo activities and projects? So for this session of 90 minutes, we have uh, with us uh, four speakers from the four main regional geo. They will provide concrete examples of mutually beneficial interactions between regional geo and geo flagships, initiatives, or community activities, with the aim of identifying good practice for other activities that may be interest in expanding their impact in the region. In Canberra, the side event connecting the global and the local SDGs and the regional geo showcase already how the four regional geo acts as transmission and value adding mechanism to make these geo efforts at the global level relevant to their regional, national and local communities. The discussion at that time last year focused already on how share local data and knowledge can contribute to the global endeavor whilst responding to local priorities, challenges, and needs. So this session aims at discussing how to join effort between the geo flagships and initiatives and the four regional geo. 
they will start uh, each of them with uh, with a presentation that outlines uh, with concrete examples some of their mutually beneficial interactions they have established with the geo activities. They should as well cover the question why to go regional and what are the unique benefits of acting regionally. Those interactions, of course, can go in both directions, downscaling geo activities to specific region and context, or they can as well be seen for bringing local and regional knowledge to the intention of the geo community. In addition to examples stemming from the geo flagships initiative and community activities, there will be additional examples covering the geos infrastructure and how regional geo can integrate themselves in the architecture. So, as I mentioned earlier, there will be four presentations today, one for each regional geo, with the following speakers. And forgive me for the pronunciation. Obu Odua from uh, Kenya, Angelica Gutierrez from uh, the US, and Hiroyuki Muraoka from Japan. And the last one will be co-presented by uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Jos van Bemelen from the European Space Agency and myself. Next uh, slide. In between each uh, presentation, the presentation that are pre-recorded and that are, I remind you that they are available on the GEO website, so I hope that you had the chance to have a look at them, but they will still remain on the GEO website, so you can, of course, uh, watch them again after the session finish. So after each presentation, there will be a Q&A short uh, session. And let me remind you a few guidelines on how uh, uh, the interaction should take place uh, with the presenter. So, um, if you want to watch the video of the session, as I mentioned, uh, they are available on the, on the GEO uh, website. But for the questions and for inter interacting with the presenters, you have to go to the Slido website and use the code hashtag GEO, select session number nine, and ask the questions during the live session. We will moderate those uh, questions. And the Slido channel will remain open for 48 hours after the session. Don't, for, don't forget to follow us as well on, uh, on, on Twitter. And uh, now I will have the pleasure to introduce, and that will be my uh, last uh, slide, to introduce our first uh, speaker, Fobu Odwar. She's with us uh, from Nairobi. And she works at the Regional Center for Mapping of Resource or Development. Her role includes regional coordination of geo and AFRIGEO activities within the continent and engagement with the geo secretariat and AFRIGEO community. Ferb, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everyone. I'll be making a presentation on the AFRIGEO initiatives, basically how we're taking the global initiative to the local context. My name is Phoebe Odor. I represent the AFRIGEO Secretariat. So basically leading activities that involve of a engagement with the Geo Secretariat as well as the Afri Geo community, with our overarching goal being the promotion or use of observation data by government in decision making processes. Mm -hmm. First, I want to highlight the new member countries we have, and uh, in the last one year, we've been able to bring on board two new countries, that is Rwanda and Sierra Leone. And you can see from the statement made uh, by Rwanda. In that uh, the reason they joined uh, this uh, group is to be able to share with other geo members on best practices and also how they can be able to um, more or less utilize geo information and management and uh, um, basically uh, at observation. Uh, in terms of, of our user engagement activities, we do this through different working groups. So for each and every application area, um, forestry, land degradation, in uh, agriculture and food security, in uh, capacity building, data and infrastructure, we have working groups where different uh, members form a community of practice where they're able to share how what they're working on, the challenges they're facing, and how they can be able to address those. We also use the AFRIGEO mailing list, which is basically a database that has been built over 10 years to be able to share different resources as well as funding opportunities. 
The workshops have also been very key in uh, basically engaging with the communities as well as addressing specific issues. And below that, I've highlighted two workshops where one was held in Pretoria, and we were basically doing an Afrigio land degradation neutrality workshop to address the challenges we're having in the community and also look at what tools are available and how we can be able to address capacity building. Um, we also held uh, last year in August a digital Earth Africa launch at RCMRC uh, that was done just before the Afrigio symposium. We have over time and again used uh, industry track and other exhibition forums as an opportunity to engage with the uh, stakeholders from the countries as well as high ranking officials. And the geoplenary is one such good area because during the ministerials we have ministers from different uh, countries convening. Uh, the Africa Symposium is also another opportunity where we bring the community together to share uh, what they're working on as a community and also to develop the working a working plan and action plan that we are going to be taking forward. Resource and mobilization collaboration has been very key for us, and here we're looking at collaboration both regionally, globally, and also uh, nationally. So we have been collaborating with groups like SEALs on the working group uh, on capacity development to see which aspects of capacity building and where the capacity gaps are in the region that they can be able to address and they've been able to provide a training resources for the community. We've also engaged with the survey program as well as Digital Up Africa. Um, to be able to address uh, basically different challenges and also opportunities. The Astran community has also been very, uh, very key in addressing the connectivity challenges we face, face in the region, and they're looking at ways of basically working through the Africa and also GMS in Africa to be able to address these issues. We have also created partnership to develop joint proposals, as well as the created MOUs with different institutions like Kenya Space Agency and SANSA to continue uh, basically having a framework for better collaboration and better uh, working arrangements. We also um, encourage co-funding where uh, after geo funds specific elements and different partners also pull in their resources. Um, we have recently developed a working group on statistics, and basically what we're trying to do with this working group, we realize that the uh, statistics community for many countries in Africa, they have a challenge in utilizing earth observation data, and we are seeing that now earth observation data is basically addressing some of those gaps that the statistics say are not able to basically uh, have all the data available. So this integration makes uh, the data available in places where there is no data. So we're trying to bring this community talking to each other and also basically just sharing the good practices and the challenges they are facing. Um, we have a working group on COVID-19. Basically, this is an ad, hoc, an ad hoc working group that was developed for countries to be able to share different experiences on how they're using app observation data in monitoring. COVID-19. It's also an opportunity for us to provide access to critical data as well as an opportunity for networking and collaboration. So through this working group also we're trying to use a, a survey to be able to identify some of the data gaps and needs that the region is facing. And uh, basically some of the achievements that we've been able to get through this working group, one is we have representation from 37 countries coming from nine countries and also we have others outside the region. We also have the involvement of private sector. Basically, we are trying to ensure that each and every a group is, uh, is, is, is represented. And some of the resources we've been able to share include some of what is publicly available from the Africa Geo portal. We have been able to share high resolution uh, images for cities with the community that is basically coming from Digital Globe. We've been able to share a, what the African Union is doing and also what Facebook and other partners are doing to be able to provide a much more higher resolution settlement layer that other people may not be aware of. Also, just to highlight that uh, the University of Energy and Resources in Ghana has been able to build an artificial intelligence algorithm that can be used to 
profile cases in different countries on in three different stages. So the emerging stage, the stage where it's speaking and the stage where they've already overcome uh, the challenge per se. So this helps us to understand where each and every country is at. And if you want more information about this particular work, you can reach out to Mark. Um, in our role as the regional geo, we are trying to influence, leverage, and adopt geo initiatives and activities and, and ensure that they are responding to our regional needs. GeoGlam is one of the uh, geo initiatives that basically we have seen being utilized as an early warning tool by government to be able to understand the performance of crops in the region. So this is very, this has been very key not just in informing the regional uh, regional markets and also for performance, but also being adopted by different governments to suit their national needs and also uh, influence market price for crops in the region based on how uh, the crop is performing. Uh, we also have the Digital Earth Africa that has very specific outputs that uh, include uh, providing analysis ready data that is free and open to all sectors and also bringing together different governments and African stakeholders. And uh, what we're seeing uh, is that the Digital Earth Africa program is aligning very well uh, with different uh, valued uh, information in Africa. Uh, some of the key achievements Digital Earth Africa has been able to achieve in the past year include making a Landsat data a, with very clear observation available for, for the region to use a, rather data as well. But uh, one key product that uh, we're seeing is uh, gaining a lot of momentum is the water observation from space products, which shows the performance of water features over time period. So where you see the blue areas is basically areas with permanent water, and when it tends to green, then those are more or less seasonal. And we're seeing this uh, product being used in uh, basically understanding even where ephemeral water bodies are and also in uh, assessment of flood, flooding events. Um, we've also had engagement with the geo LDN, and we have engaged with them at a global and also at a regional level. So at the global level, we're trying to develop better standards for the sub-indicators. So this is the sub-indicators on land productivity, on soil organic carbon, as well as on land cover. At a regional level, we are more or less looking into developing a framework for capacity building. Uh, we're also looking at specifying the minimum uh, characteristics of data set, as well as of, uh, developing an open source system and tools to assist countries in measuring land, uh, land degradation. Uh, we've also had engagements with the Geo Blue Planet. So basically, the challenges that Geo Blue Planet is trying to address is that of illegal, uncontrolled, and unreported fishing that we're seeing is basically leading to loss of revenue from different countries, loss of employment, as well as declined fish. So in this particular case, as you can see from what is happening in Ghana, as you can see, from 1990, the fish stocks have really, really been reducing a um, from what you can see in 2020. So um, Geo Blue Planet is partnering with uh, GMS to be able to basically provide input on how art observation can be utilized in uh, observing uh, illegal, illegal boats, for instance, and informing the relevant authorities in, in this. Uh, so basically, this, this, this is actually enriching and also giving the government more control in terms of uh, basically just surveillance and doing what is happening within their territories. Um, I think I want to stop there because uh, our role, like I mentioned, is just to try and ensure that the government are able to see the value of our observation and what it can do. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Fobe, uh, uh, for your presentation. I think it illustrates perfectly well the expected role regional geo can play within the geo community. As you have heard from our presentation, AfriGeo brings together already 29 countries, which is quite impressive. I'm very pleased to note as well that a, a number of geo initiatives and flagships are adapted to your regional and local needs. As a matter of fact, I would like to raise the first question. 
in the last months, the African continent has been relatively preserved from the COVID-19 pandemic. Even if, as you explained us, most of the countries are still in their emerging phase. Was it easy to defend to public authorities the benefits of Earth observation, and how did you engage with them? Uh, your microphone is mute. Thank you, John, for that question. Uh, I want to indicate that uh, the region has was more or less lucky to be the last recipient of this disease. So in that regard, we had a lot of learning lessons from other countries. So governments took very early action in terms of implementing curfews, closing borders, establishing lockdown. Uh, as a community, we have a very good network with different institutions who have acted as ambassadors. So you can see already we have more than 50% of the region uh, in terms of countries uh, being uh, represented. And in that regard, they, they become the ambassadors of telling government the value of that observation. And we have seen uh, in this COVID season how what role uh, that observation has been playing in uh, informing government even the location of these particular cases. And also just uh, letting governments know uh, use this data to know which are the hotspot areas. Uh, through the Afri Geo community, we were able to establish a working group on COVID. And this working group, basically, we're trying to uh, share with different uh, countries what each and every country is, used, is using art observation for, especially in addressing uh, COVID. Part of what we have seen has been very useful is also just um, sharing the resources that are available with the community. And you, you can imagine that uh, different countries are at different places as far as utilizing our observation data is. So this becomes then an easy way of channeling that kind of knowledge and, and learning. And uh, also just a, I would want to recommend the fact that uh, because of this pandemic, uh, uh, high resolution data has been made available by Digital Block and through the community been able to more or less share this knowledge. So many countries already have this data. And we are still working in ways of how we can be able to make more resources available to the community. Um, I also want to indicate that the Earth observation data also has been utilized by countries in different ways. We are seeing countries now using a Earth observation to monitor even air quality um, in this uh, pandemic situation. And we are seeing that there's a lot of improvement. And we're also seeing Earth observation playing a role in also addressing other challenges that countries are facing in this COVID season besides COVID. Food security is one of those challenges. And it's very key that uh, because farmers are affected, everybody is affected, we must also look at what is the outlook on food, uh, on, on food security. And countries and governments have been requesting for that information, which we've been able to utilize and share with them. Okay, thank you very much. This very comprehensive uh, answer. I take uh, a look at the Slido, and I would like to take uh, a questions uh, to you that maybe uh, we can uh, raise again uh, because it's addressed to everyone. How do you prioritize in your own uh, regional geo earth observation needs and solution? Forbe, if you want to start, and maybe I will come back uh, as the time is running. Uh, to the other speakers uh, after each of their presentation with the same question. Bobby? Yes. So to start, uh, like I indicate, part of our main objective is to promote the use of earth observation. We are in a place where we need to be providing evidence for a lot of decisions that are, that are being taken by government. And earth observation has been very key in providing that kind of information. We're also saying that earth observation is being utilized also to provide a solution where data gaps are, 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 are there. Um, we have been encouraging countries to use this data, for example, in trying to provide better information as far as population data is concerned, because we're seeing a gap. Census is done 10 years in many countries, and after the 10-year period, we still need to be making projections on how population is, is um, developing. So Earth Observation has been utilized in trying to make those, those, those estimates and projections, and governments have been very uh, open to adopting such kind of mechanisms. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's move now to our next uh, speaker from the other side of the Atlantic. Angelica Gutierrez uh, works at the NOAA Office of Water Prediction, and she's the main and recognized driving force behind Amerigero. 
Our presentation reflects the local, national, and regional interests of the GEO country members. AmeriGEO is entrenched in the institutional and technical capabilities of its country members and seeks to increase institutional and personal capacity. Angelica, up to you to present AmeriGEO. Good morning. On behalf of the co-chairs of AmeriGEO, the Coordination Working Group, and the leads of activities in our region, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning. My name is Angelica Gutierrez, and I am a lead scientist at NOAA in the United States. I am a member also of USGEO, the co-chair of the regional AmeriGEO, and the Global Water Sustainability GeoGlose. This morning, I will be discussing the role of AmeriGEO in user engagement, resource mobilization, and the importance of scaling geo-global activities to a regional, national, and local level. AmeriGEO was established in 2014 by the GEO members in the Americas with three specific requirements to reflect the local, national, and regional interests of the GEO country members, that the initiative be entrenched in the institutional and technical capabilities of its country members, and to seek to increase institutional and personal capacity in the use of Earth observations so that the decision-making process could be influenced by the knowledge from observations. The government's framework is comprised of the Americas Caucus at the top, which participates in the GEO Executive Committee and provides guidance to the Regional Coordination Working Group. The Regional Coordination Working Group reports to the Americas Caucus and is responsible for the overall coordination of activities among GEO member countries, global initiatives, flagships, participant organizations, associates, and other organizations outside of GEO. The AmeriGEO strategic priorities are focused on five societal benefit areas agreed by the caucus. Biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability, disaster resilience, food security and sustainable agriculture, water resources management, and health. The activities from these priority areas are linked to the global flagships and initiatives in GEO and are also linked to the global GEO priority areas. Capacity development is the foundation to all AmeriGEO activities. On the role of AmeriGEO in user engagement. To start, I want to highlight that since 2014, we have increased the number of GEO member countries from 13 to 20, with El Salvador, Guatemala, joining GEO in 19, 2019, and the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua joining GEO in 2020. The analysis for the development of the GEO engagement strategy identifies strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, and threats. We took not only the recommendations of the strategy, but implemented actions to address identified issues in the analysis. We are developing capacities in the GEO member countries, by leveraging existing expertise, technologies, and efforts in countries across the region. We are also expanding and strengthening partnerships by engaging countries and advocating the participation in GEO. The AmeriGEO's technical approach has been shared with UNGGIM Americas, Regional Coordination Working Group, as an opportunity to leverage and partner between the two organizations to achieve shared goals and objectives in the Americas. We are in the process of developing joint work plans with organizations such as UNGGIM, the Pan American Institute of Geography and History, PAGE, and other regional organizations seeking development to develop a common platform for the Americas. This conversation is also taking place with UNEP as we are assisting them in the development of an information framework for the Forum of Ministers of the Environment of Latin America and the Caribbean the objective within this discussion is to design a solid platform capable of consolidating the most relevant information to describe the state and trends in the environment for whole Latin America and Caribbean region. One of the threats identified in the geo engagement strategy was that the perception by the geo community of a top down external strategy disconnected from their own activities. In 2016, AmeriGEO started mapping the capabilities and needs and identifying the national objectives by country. Information developed not only through the GEO principal organization, but also through the efforts of the thematic activities. 
This exercise not only highlighted the need to strengthen the national geos, but highlighted issues in which global geo flagships and initiatives were already with activities in many of the countries, but without connecting to the geo principle of those countries. In 2019, the Caucus of Geo Principles requested that all geo initiatives and flagships with interests or projects in the region provided information about their activities to the AmeriGeo Coordination Working Group. In 2020, we welcome a new global initiative in our region, led by GeoColombia with the participation from Chile, Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, GeoNOM will be engaged in the region for high mountains activities. Through foundational activities, we are also addressing the need to establish links between the geo principles and their national agencies and relevant policy implementers. Through an extensive campaign for capacity development, which includes AmeriGeo Week, webinars, and other capacity development efforts provided by organizations in geo member countries and partners in the region, we are strengthening the national geos as we target all the government organizations that can benefit from the instructions on the use of Earth observations. Some resource mobilization is achieved through responding to user-driven needs. Foundational activities address needs identified in the national or institutional development plans of the geo country members. Other resource mobilization is achieved through partnerships with academia and partners institution, which is the case of AmeriGeo Week, in which the majority of host institutions are national universities that also benefit from the instruction by hosting the event. During the AmeriGeo Week, for example, the links between the geo principles and the national agencies and relevant policy implementers are strengthened through the technical and policy exchange occurring during the event and through the thematic activities. Since 2016, with the first AmeriGeo Week hosted by Geo Colombia, we have provided instructions to more than 300 national and local institutions throughout the region. AmeriGeo successful engagement is reflected also in the number of volunteers from more than 25 national organizations participating in the Geo Global Working Groups to support the translation of the newly endorsed Canberra Declaration into concrete actions. 106 participants from the America are now engaged in this task. AmeriGeo is focusing on the delivery of services to support the transformation of data for decision making and through concrete activities have reached consensus on how to achieve the GEOs. In 2016, three major initiatives, Boost BioEco, OBIS, and GeoBond, and Bond, signed a collaboration agreement to build a sustained, coordinated global ocean system of marine, biological, and ecosystem observations. The pole-to-pole and -pole Bond network of the Americas represents the marine environment and biodiversity focus within AmeriGeo. It is comprised of researchers and managers from Canada to Patagonia and experts who focuses on strategies for biodiversity monitoring and conservation and contribute to the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, OBIS, which is the world's largest open access marine biogeographic database. A second system to achieve the GEOS is GeoNetCast Americas, a near real-time network of satellite-based data dissemination system. The GeoNetCast system is a foundational task under the Geo Common Infrastructure and AmeriGeo. There are currently 92 stations in 19 countries, and the broadcasted products are continuously updated through cooperation between NOAA in the United States and INPE in Brazil. These products are used by HydroMed services for a variety of applications, including the development of weather forecasts. Another example is related to the AmeriGeo platform. In the last three years, since we initiated the development of the AmeriGeo platform, we have made great strides mobilizing data and resources, but we are still limited in our ability to synthesize and transform this data into products and services for decision-making. We need to close the technology gap and provide broad access 
to services that support analysis, synthesis, and transformations. The AmeriGeo platform brings together social, economic, and environmental data from a large community of contributors. The platform was established to increase regional capacity to acquire, share, store, maintain, and utilize Earth observation data and information. Over 500,000 assets are currently hosted by the AmeriGeo platform. Assets that are acquired from the national open data portals and other regional and international open data portals. On the left, lower left, there is a selected sample of organizations connected to the AmeriGeo platform. One of the challenges we have in the America is the integration of data, and we are working and discussing the possibilities with various organizations such as GeoSUR, PAGE, UNGGIM, and others to integrate their assets into what we envision as the Americas platform. The platform will include a geolab that provides authoritative and quality assured data, supports sign applications, co-creation, co-development, reproductivity of products and services. AmeriGeo is also working with several organizations in the region to support the need for high resolution data. And this includes a cooperation with CONIDA in Peru. In 2020, we are introducing the Americas Academy, a space where the community will be able to access training and other resources for capacity development. I will present a couple of demonstrations on how AmeriGeo is working with GEO country members to achieve from data to decisions. These activities are linked to capacity development from global initiatives or flagships in the areas of priority of AmeriGeo. The first example is related to a work, a project done in the context of SAR, an ongoing AmeriGeo NASA project led by Dr. Franz Meyer of the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. More than 20 projects funded by NASA in the Americas and in AmeriGeo framework. This is one of those projects and is focused on hazard monitoring and ecosystem monitoring. Through workshops and capacity development, organizations in Colombia, Ecuador, and El Salvador implemented the use of SAR in operational environments. These training activities use open data and open methods. The next example is related to the application of Earth observations in Argentina. On the left, this is an example in the priority area of food security and sustainable agriculture within AmeriGeo. In early 2018, Argentina suffered one of the worst droughts in its history. Coordination through the Agricultural Monitoring in the Americas and GeoGlam, the National Institute of Technology for Agriculture, INTA, was able to provide the Ministry of Agro-Industry the evidence-based information they needed to declare a state of emergency due to a record-breaking drought through the use of Earth observations using NASA MODIS data. On the right, this is an example in the priority area for water resources management within AmeriGeo. The National Institute of Hydrological Resources, INRI, the National Water Authority in the Dominican Republic, coordinates the distribution and management of the resource. During the flooding that devastated the Caribbean in 2017, and due to the pass of Hurricane Maria, Andres, Director of Hydrology, used the GeoGloss ECMWF Streamflow Services to guide emergency response preparedness and mitigation. In conclusion, the guidance from the Geo Engagement Strategy Plan has been an invaluable benefit to AmeriGeo. We will continue supporting the engagement of geoglobal activities to ensure the engagement of the regional community in their activities. We want to thank you for your attention this morning and invite you to engage in AmeriGeo. Thank you for your presentation, Angelica. I particularly like the way your strategic priorities are all linked to the geo priority actions, such as GeoGlam, for example, to face the state of emergency following the drought in Argentina, or GeoGloss when the hurricane Maria hit the Dominican Republic. Uh, before checking Slido and go back to the, to the questions from the community, I would like to ask you 
a very simple question. Looking the other way around, which of the Americ Geo assets would be the most valuable to be reused in the Geo? With no doubt, the greatest asset from AmeriGeo is the empowerment of its people. And this empowerment has been a product of the clear guidance, not only from our GEO principles, but also from other uh, bodies like the program board. Um, and I want to highlight uh, the leadership of Dr. Camara. His vision has been an inspiration for the region. Uh, the region has actually um, realized through this empowerment that only through the collective contribution um, we will be able to address all the needs that are many in our region. And so uh, that clear guidance has been the key to empower the, the entire uh, organization. Thank you, Angelica. So again, uh, looking back at the, the question that uh, Cathy Fontaine raised uh, to hold the regional geo, how do you prioritize in Ameri Geo Earth observation needs and solution? When Ameri Geo was created in 2014, the geo principles were very um, specific as to um, at that moment there was many societal benefit areas in geo, and they decided to focus on four priority areas, which was water, biodiversity, and ecosystems, disaster, and agriculture. And in the last last year in Peru, um, the GEO principles met again in the caucus, um, and they added in, uh, another priority area. So we focus on, on those particular areas. And, it, you know, how they prioritize is, is actually based on, on their own knowledge of what the situations uh, and needs are in their own countries. Okay, thank you. Uh, before uh, moving to the next uh, presentation, there is, uh, it's not a question, it's a comment and it's good news uh, uh, from uh, Natalia Dono. She highlighted that uh, GeoNet, the, she appreciated the reference to the GeoNet uh, Cast Americas and she's very proud to announce that uh, they receive a GNCA station in Panama. Just new, it's a new information from uh, this week. And then another uh, last question before moving uh, to the next uh, presentation. Have the National Geo emerged in an organic way or more guided by Ameri Geo? How do you balance? How do you see this uh, balance? We have been working on um I, I don't know if I understood the question very well. Um, if AmeriGeo guides the nationals or yeah, the or, or, or was it or were the national geo in the leadership to bring to, together their force? Uh, where it's, did it's, the, the input came from? The it's actually a, a balance. I mean, we um, in some countries we are assisting the national geos to. Um, to flourish, if, if you may. And others are the national geos who actually take the lead. And uh, so it's, it's a matter of uh, adapting to the different situations. Every country is different, um, but the objective, regional objectives are, are very clear. And I think that that's uh, the clear objective is what keep us, you know, moving forward in a organized but flexible way. Um, so that we can adapt to the different needs in, in the various countries. Okay, good, perfect. Thank you, Angelica. Thanks. Let's uh, move now to the, the next presentation. So our, our third presentation comes from the Asia Oceania Regional Geo, AOGEO, which is uh, represented today by Professor Hiroyuki Muraoka. Hiroyuki is professor at the Gifu University in uh, Japan and technical advisor at MEXT, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology. His presentation, AOGEO, from observation to knowledge development, integration and contribution to the three engagement priorities, will focus on the cooperation of regional geo and work program activities. In particular, in particular, our regional activities enable the community to tackle the challenge 
a cross de thématique areas, Hiroyuki de Floris Yours. This is a presentation for the session of Regional Geo, and the title is AO Geo from Observations to Knowledge Development, Integration, and Contribution to Three Engagement Priorities. My name is Hiroyuki Muraoka, working as a professor of plant and ecosystem ecology in Gifu University, Japan. I have been involved in Asia Oceania Geo since its establishment in 2016 and a member of AO Geo Coordination Board. We are facing global environmental changes through regional changes and challenges at local scales for sustainable development, disaster risk reduction, and mitigation and adaptation to climate change. While considering the global concerns, we also consider that there are regional commonalities and differences or regional contexts. Therefore, regional coordination and cooperation by inclusive con communication are crucial for the community to tackle the challenges across the thematic areas. By enhancing the cooperation between regional geos and work program activities with a com convening power of geo, the global community could work together to meet a shared agenda such as SDGs, Sendai Framework, and Paris Agreement. Asia Oceania region contains several unique characteristics in geography, population, climate change, natural disasters, and socio-economic development. AOGO is cooperating to strengthen comprehensive ability of Earth observations and applications in the region and wishing to cooperate with Global Geo to address the global issues. This is the outline of AO Geo implementation plan in the Geo Work Program. AO Geo is consists of Asia Oceania Caucus, Coordination Board, Integrated Priority Studies, Task Groups for Semantic Application and Services, and Foundational Tasks. AOGO Symposium and AOGO Workshop function as the fora of these activities. These structure and activities in our region have been developed through inclusive communication and cooperation since the beginning of GEO. In last November, prior to the GEO Week in Canberra, we convened to hold 20th AOGO Symposium. We had more than 200 participants from 35 countries. We shared the updated activities in the region and discussed how do we scale up those approaches and results to the region and also to meet the global agenda, namely SDGs, Sendai Framework, and Paris Agreement. This is the list of task groups in AOGO. As you can see, all the thematic task groups are linked with geo flagships and initiatives. Asian Water Cycle Initiative is linked with geo growth. Asia Pacific Biodiversity Observation Network is a regional partner of GeoBone. Ocean Coasts and Islands cooperates with Blue Planet. Asia Rice Crop Estimation and Monitoring Group cooperates with GeoGlam. Drought Monitoring Evaluation with GeoLDN, Disaster Resilience Group with GeoDalma, and Himalayan Geos with GeoNorm. Then let me introduce examples of the task groups and their interactions. Asian Water Cycle Initiative, AWCI, is realizing the connection from observations to integrated analysis and prediction knowledge de development, and deliver to decision makers. AWCI launched full-scale efforts to activate platforms on water resilience and disasters by promoting dialogues, reinforcing partnerships, sharing data, information, models, tools, 
experiences and ideas, and expanding sustainable practices. They are implementing this process by developing data integration and analysis system, DS. Thus, AWCI is connecting Earth observations and analysis with the stakeholders toward achieving the global agenda by promoting concerted actions. Another task group focusing on water issue has been newly initiated as drought monitoring and evaluation. It has two four objectives. To provide timely and free access to data products, information, and services for effective drought monitoring, evaluation, and management. To support a better understanding of the factors determining vulnerability to drought. A specific effort was made on a pilot study on the web-based system on drought monitoring and evaluation for Mongolia case. Cooperation with other geo activities is aiming with GeoLDN. Water is a critical component of our, our Earth system and multiple societal benefits. In the last AO Geo Symposium, AWCI, Drought Monitoring and Evaluation, and the Task Group 5 Asia Rise had a joint session to seek collaborative efforts for regional challenges. They clarified that it is important for risk managers of water-related disasters to advance understanding on the impact of drought and flood on agriculture by using Earth observation data and integrated platform like DS. Asia-Pacific Biodiversity Observation Network, APBON, has also a long-term activity over 10 years. APBON focuses on biodiversity and ecosystems and their services in terrestrial, freshwater, coast, and marine. Observations of biodiversity and ecosystem consist of manual field survey, sensor networks, remote sensing, and communication with local human communities. The activities also include capacity building for biological sensors such as species monitoring data and knowledge sharing by book publications, and contributions to IPBES regional and global assessments. Last year, APBON developed its new decade work plan towards 2030. Task Group 3, Carbon and Greenhouse Gas Initiative, is aiming at coordinating and generating regional cooperation to deliver best science on carbon and greenhouse gas estimates. Policy mandate is clear in the Paris Climate Agreement, particularly contributing to reporting global stock take by combining various observations and model analysis. In recent assessment reports, such as by IPBES, there is a growing need to fill gaps in observations and mechanistic understanding on the biodiversity and ecosystems, carbon cycle, and climate change. There are the components and processes of the basis of sustainable development goals. In addition, this requirement is quite intense for terrestrial domain due to its complexity. In the symposium, APBON and Common Greenhouse Gas Initiative had a joint session to clarify the observational gaps, particularly for Southeast Asian region where high biodiversity is existing and carbon sequestration is expected, while climate and societal changes are intense. By the communication, we see co cooperative observations of biodiversity and carbon cycle by combining in situ and satellite observations together with modeling analysis. We also recognize that such activity needs to engage with other in-situ observation networks like AsiaFlux and ILTR. In order to address the multidisciplinary issues in our changing environment, AOGO is attempting to build integrated study in the region. The focus includes water, biodiversity, carbon and GHG, ocean, food production, disaster, 
mountains, land exchange, islands, and so on. AOGO initiated its cooperative activity to tackle the interrelated issues by launching Integrated Priority Studies, IPS. IPS aims to promote cross-cutting activities among the tasks to encourage experts to join the AOGO efforts and to demonstrate the values of Earth observation data in the region. As a pilot of IPS, we are focusing on Mekong River Basin, Pacific Islands, and Himalayan Mountains. In the AOGO Symposium, the task groups attempted to analyze their activities and mapped onto the goals or pillars of these global agendas as shown on this slide. Not only for the goals, but we also consider our contributions to the respective indicators under each goal. The map shows that the AOGO community contributes to sustainable development goals, particularly related to food security, water resources, climate action, biodiversity on land and in water. Some groups are also clearly addressing Paris Agreement and Sendai Framework. By sharing this information, AOGO and its task groups are designing to strengthen the Earth observation, knowledge production, and the deliver to the society. Finally, I'm showing the statement as the outcome of the symposium. In every symposium, the statement is adopted by the symposium plenary, and we share this as the regional objectives. In Canberra, we have reviewed the regional efforts and outcomes and stated our next steps by considering the global, regional, and local challenges. Each of the task groups and other or activities involved in AOGO states their contributions to the three engagement priorities and also clarify that future attempts which we should share and address by cooperation. I stop here and thank you very much for your attention. More details can be found in the supplementary materials of this presentation file or please visit us in the, on the website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well, Hiroyuki, for this comprehensive uh, presentation that I think uh, illustrates the incredible diversity of engagements AOGO has taken in its region. And I have to say that I would like to raise as a first question, a question on the Integrated Priority Studies, IPS, you, you present. There seem to be a particularly interesting source of knowledge. How do you see it possible, it's possible uptake by the rest of the geo community? And in particular, how this knowledge could be included in the geos and accessible from the geos infrastructure? Yeah, thank you very much, Jean, uh, for this uh, coordinating this uh, session. And also, hello again, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your question. And uh, let me introduce uh, answer to your question by sharing our kind of activities so far. So as I have introduced in my presentation, uh, AOGO involves multiple thematic task groups for regional applications. And many of these task groups have been developed as communities of practice by having GEOS Asia Pacific Symposium, now we call AOGO Symposium, as the regional forum since the beginning of GEO. And through the, this event and through the regional coordination, AOGO initiated this integrated priority studies to enhance the engagements and also to implement co-design among the task groups and their users. So uh, I think these activities based on daily and multidisciplinary disciplinary communication could be a kind of model for facilitating the cooperation between the many activities involved in the work program. And uh, regarding just infrastructure, uh, currently we are considering the IPS as the project to, de to demonstrate the 
generating interdisciplinary knowledge by gathering available data in the, on, to the data cube for targeting pirate area. And also, we, we have a strength to connect the in-situ satellite and many other uh, observation platforms. So by having this uh, knowledge, then uh, through the regional cooperation, I think we can fit into the global platforms, either in the community development or the infrastructure development and their uh, use, utilization. Thank you. Thank you, Hoyuko. Uh, another uh, question, which is again the, the same that uh, I find to the previous uh, speaker. How do you prioritize Earth observation needs and solutions uh, within uh, your region? Yep, thank you very much for this uh, important question again. Uh, again, our, as I also mentioned in my last answer and also in the, my presentation, in our region, we have been uh, developing the community uh, consists of the observation community and also the user communities, including the governments, uh, by having the Geos Asia Pacific Symposium as the platform to communicate between the users, stakeholders, and also players and in many kind of, uh, I mean, people. Then, of course, uh, we always, we have been always considering about the societal benefit areas of the GEO uh, for the nine uh, areas in the first decade of GEO and also the eight application-oriented SPAs in this second decade of GEO. And also the AO GEO is uh, focusing on the three engagement priorities uh, of the GEO. So uh, by having these fora, and also by sharing our objectives and also the environmental issues like disaster risk, food security, and biodiversity in our region, uh, we are uh, trying to shape our Earth observation needs and also try to respond to such needs by gathering all the data and also the efforts. Thank you. Thanks. Before moving to the next uh, presentation, another um questions and uh, well, I will again raise it to the other uh, speakers uh, uh, after the last presentation. How regional initiatives are sharing experience in terms of establishment of their activities and network? Sharing experience as well, uh, what I'm interested to understand is how they are, they are interacting as well with uh, the other regional geos. Yeah, thank you. In the uh, AOGO, uh, as I mentioned, we have the symp annual symposium as a plenary of the AOGO. And also we have the AOGO workshop. This is the capacity development or capacity building efforts for the training course and also some semantic uh, issues. Then, uh, and also we have the task groups and each of the task groups have their own daily communication and also uh, to develop their activities. And the uh, AOGO coordination board has a function to uh, connect all these activities, daily activities as the regional uh, platform. Then we generate this uh, communication and also the share, experience sharing and also develop our uh, future activities. I think I, I, okay. I was able to answer that. Yes. Thank you, Hoyuki. Um, let's move to the last uh, presentation of these sessions, together with my colleague from the European Space Agency, Joost van Bemelen. We will close this series of presentations with a more technical presentation looking at how the GEOS platform can be further developed to make, to make uh, regional capabilities globally available. I will start the presentation with a quick introduction to Eurogeo, mostly for the ones that are not familiar with this initiative. Then uh, Yoast, that has led the European funded uh, research project EDGE, which stands for European Direction in Geos Common Infrastructure Enhancement, will take over and finish the presentation. So Yoast is a program project manager at uh, ESRIN, the 
the European Space Agency Center for Earth Observation, where he is responsible, among other responsibilities, for technology development activities with a focus on big Earth observation data. Let's go now straight to the presentation. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. This is my pleasure, together with my colleague from the European Space Agency, Jos van Bemmelen, to deliver a presentation in this uh, seventh session on the evolution of the GEOS platform to make regional capabilities globally available. So you will see here that I'm working for the European Commission as a policy officer. I'm uh, basically managing the Eurogeo initiative together with my colleagues, uh, Marianne Van Merlo and uh, Gilles Ollier. And uh, we are uh, very uh, interested in uh, sharing experience of the Eurogeo initiative and how uh, we have been uh, developing it, uh, including uh, by trying to uh, strengthen the GEOS uh, infrastructure and the GEOS platform, which will be the second part of this presentation. But let's start with a few words about the Eurogeo initiative. So Eurogeo is a well-known and now mature initiative. It was uh, started uh, in 2017 in Washington during the GEO uh, plenary um, the work program that uh, supports the Rogeo is really something that we design with the entire community, and uh, the last one is currently under uh, implementation. Essentially, what are our activities are mobilized around a number of action groups that uh, aim at developing uh, pre-operational earth observation service. But we use as well European uh, Commission, European Union tools and programs like the Horizon 2020 and the Copernicus programs to uh, provide the necessary uh, framework to support uh, the entire uh, initiative. And that includes, of course, uh, relatively large amounts of uh, funding. What is important to mention as well is it's a co-driven initiative between uh, several uh, commission service and a number of stakeholders from a uh, participating organization in GEO and member states. Just in one slide before passing the floor to yours to what we consider as the key elements of the added value of Eurogeo is uh, we have succeeded to uh, frame Eurogeo as an incubator, a facilitator, focusing on the downstream part of the value chain and complementing existing programs, uh, namely the Copernicus program, but other European Earth Observation super, supporting initiatives like our Horizon 2020 research program and the space program. So we consider that Eurogeo is a bit the voice of Europe in the geo community. It engages via its member states and participating organizations in all the geo flagships, initiative, community activities, but as well in the foundational task. What we try to do is to anticipate as well what will be the upcoming uh, Earth observation landscape, trying to investigate a new area of interest, like the move towards a service-oriented architecture, uh, how to address in situ gaps, how to include citizens or object-driven observation, how to ensure that we maintain the connection with the science supporting uh, all of this. Uh, what you will see now is uh, a number of piloting activities that have been developed with the support of the Horizon 2020 program that show how regional capabilities can be made available globally via the GEOS platform. And now I will close this first introduction and pass the floor to my colleague, Jos van Bellen. Thank you for providing me with uh, the possibility to present the evolution of the GEOS platform and how it makes regional capabilities globally available. And my name is uh, indeed Joost van Bemmelen. I'm working at the European Space Agency in Italy, and I'm involved in big Earth observation data related activities, in particular in data ground segments implementation, operations and exploitation. This is a short overview of the GEOS platform. You will know that it is an evolution of the GEOS common infrastructure. It was actually renamed in 2018, and it is a shared effort coordinated with the GEOS Secretariat. 
and the four main component developers and operators being ESA for the DOS portal, CNR for the Discovery and Access Broker, University of Geneva for the Yellow Pages and the Federal Geographic Data Committee for the Status Checker. On top, I would like to refer to the European Commission, DGRTD, who co-funded relevant parts of the GEOS platform development with a grant to ESA and CNR called EDGE, short for European Direction in GCI Enhancements. This project actually ran from October 2017 until May 2020. In EDGE, we recognize that an evolved GEOS should move from a data-centric approach to a user-centric approach, and this is in line with the main challenge in JO and Euro JOs. So the JOs platform links users with heterogeneous resources from all over the globe. And its evolution in Edge was built on three pillars, being collaboration with the end users and other stakeholders, implementation tailored to the individual users, and reuse of generic tools and instruments. So for this, we coordinated with many regional, national and international players and initiatives recognizing user centrality as the starting point for evolving jails, linking, connecting and or interfacing with their community platforms, infrastructures, systems, etc. And as such, making their capabilities globally available to others. Many stakeholders have been interviewed and invited to share their use cases and needs for us to evolve the platform and connect to them, experimenting new, evolving and sharing capabilities in response to their requirements, involving them during the full development cycle. Eventually, at the end of the project, more than 30 scenarios were completely implemented and about a dozen even partially. These scenarios consider various perspectives or communities related to the geo priority areas, which you see at the top of the slide. So these are indeed climate change, disaster risk reduction and sustainable development goals. We have other thematic areas, including water resource management, biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability, public health surveillance, agriculture and food security and sustainable urban development. We consider regional hubs such as Amiri Jail and Euro Jail, but as well the Digital Belt and Road Initiative. And last but not least, we also address some cross thematic communities. We considered as well flagships, geo initiatives, community initiatives, as well as regional initiatives. We addressed Copernicus services, Copernicus Diasis, ESA thematic exploitation platforms, H2020 projects, but as well ERA planet activities. So a whole platea of stakeholders resulting in more than 100 requirements on which basis we identified capabilities and evolved the jails platform. For some, we provide widgets for, for them to interface from their own portal with the platform. For others, we implemented mirror sites. Others directly interface via APIs with the DAP. And again, for others, we implemented additional capabilities, either e.g. in terms of search parameters, filters, views, but as well in terms of visualization, harmonization, navigation, and even execution of services. In terms of platforms, we distinguish between an operational platform, which is basically a data platform providing capabilities related to discovery and access of data, and a development platform that we use to provide proofs of concepts, how the jails platform, but as well the jails infrastructure at large could evolve to better respond to the identified user needs, which do not regard data only. So some of the scenarios led to evolution of the operational platform and others were input to the development platform. And what you see here is those which are marked with a rectangle were input to the development platform. So let's take a look at the operational platform uh, for which you see here a screen dump. You can do a search via the GEOS portal using different search parameters and filter results standard, but as well resource specific. E.g. we have specific filters for sentinels, for certain domains, etc. Results can be inspected and in case applicable, displayed on the map or downloaded. In summary, it is accessible from www.geoportal.org. It implements different types of APIs. We have a set of standard web 
service interfaces, for example, OGC service interfaces, CCAM, PyPMH, FTP, etc. We have a set of APIs for software development, client-side APIs used, for example, by the Kios portal, and server-side APIs. We have enhanced harmonization capabilities, specific instruments to support user communities, including views, now with nested views. We have widgets, we have mirror sites, we have GeoLive, which provides the possibility to users to, uh, to give feedback, and which is then dealt with. Uh, we connect 191 open data catalogs, more than 45 million data sets, and more than 400 million granules. We provide search with hints from various heterogeneous Tezauda, for example, from GRC and sales. And we have domain-specific visualization and filtering, transformation and bulk capabilities. There are now some examples of the development portal. Here you see the look and feel. As you can see, it is uh, providing a similar search capability as within the operational portal. The results will be displayed, distinguishing between data, information, and services in three different tabs. The data is basically the same as in the operational portal. The information tab allows you to navigate via relations identified by knowledge providers, and in the service tab, you can execute services. E.g., if you do a search for land degradation, you can inspect all, all tabs, but in the same but in the services step, you will find that there is the possibility to run the services that are discovered via a run icon. Clicking on it, a window will pop up that will show the workflow where you can select input data. In this case, the three sub-indicators, land productivity, land cover and soil carbon. Using the same GEOS platform, and you can select the cloud platform where you can run the selected service. Here, trends.earth. In this case, we can select between running it on Amazon, but as well on different DIASs that can be accessed via a VLAB implementation done by CNR. Credits go as well to the EcoPotential and GeoEssential projects. The second example of the development portal shows how you can navigate across information from one or more resources or knowledge providers. In this case, from the United Nations Statistics Division. Doing a search for sustainable development goals, all SDGs will be displayed. Selecting then, for example, SDG 15, live on land, you will see a right arrow via which you can show all related targets. Via target 15.3, so by 2030, combat desertification, restore degraded land and soil, including land affected by desertification, droughts and floods, and strive to achieve a land degradation neutral world, one can then open the data tab via a dedicated data icon in the target result and show the indicators. Uh, and then you can show it on the map or display it on the map with a legend, what you see in the right lower corner. And you can eventually as well compare this with similar data. So in summary, the development portal is available from the following URL, https jos.uat isaportal.eu. We consider in the development portal a move from data towards information and knowledge. We cover with the search data, services and information. And we have did dedicated tabs to display the heterogeneous data information and services. And it supports the creation of information and knowledge acquisition for decision makers and policy makers to take decisions. Brings me to the last slide of my presentation. Here actually we show that indeed uh, we recognize that there is a need to move from data to information and knowledge. We consider this actually as an input to be considered by the JOS infrastructure development task team. Based on this, we are starting documenting canonical scenarios. We identified four of them. These are actually aligned to what has been identified as well for the implementation of the knowledge hub. Uh, this, uh, according to us, could be a good input to definition of a logical architecture concerning the whole GEOS infrastructure, on which basis I believe we can directly identify next developments to support stakeholders at local, regional, and global level. So this is then input to such an architecture.
May I thank you on behalf as well of uh, Jean, and uh, please visit, uh, let's say, the following uh, URLs uh, for the GEOS portal, the development portal, and the scenarios. Thank you. Thank you, Joost. Uh, before checking one last time Slido and together with all the, the speakers and wrap up the main message from uh, this session, I would like to ask you uh, a question related to the GEOS uh, platform. As you know, a lot of emphasis has been given in the previous uh, session on uh, yesterday and on uh, Tuesday on the GEO Knowledge Hub. How do you see it integrating with the GEOS platform and what would be, in a few words, the necessary preliminary steps to take? Well, thank you, first of all, for this question. Uh, thank you as well for the possibility for providing this uh, presentation. Uh, regarding, uh, let's say, this question, um, I think that uh, we have shown that uh, the GEOS platform today is uh, mainly a, a data platform. Anyway, this is the operational platform. We have provided uh, various uh, proof of concepts uh, to uh, show that uh, we have adopted as well the user-centric approach. And uh, as we have seen is that the users are not uh, only interested in data, but as well in uh, information and uh, the relations uh, between, uh, let's say, the various uh, data, information, running services, and uh, the possibility to acquire knowledge and to take uh, well-informed uh, decisions. Uh, having said that, uh, we have done as well some uh, experimentation or implemented proof of concepts and connected to various uh, knowledge uh, providers. And uh, some of these knowledge providers uh, uh, include, uh, let's say, Zenodo, which is a general knowledge uh, hub. Uh, uh, we have uh, connected to some of uh, European projects, the Equal Potential Project, the Geocentral Project, for example, to uh, let's say to 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 look at uh, let's say SDG uh, 1531 on land uh, degradation, what I showed in the example, and uh, we believe that a similar concept could be used as well to connect to the GEOS uh, Knowledge Hub. Um, of course, this is to be uh, discussed in the context of the uh, GEOS uh, Infrastructure Development Task Team because it's a shared effort to see how to further evolve actually this uh, GEOS uh, platform together with uh, the GEOS Knowledge Hub uh, and ensure that we in a coordinated manner agree on uh, how we should interface uh, between the two of these. Thank you, Joost. Uh, yes, thank you, Joost. Uh, I just look at the Slido uh, for a few more uh, questions. One is uh, maybe directly addressed to me. It's uh, for uh, Rogeo. How are you representing and prioritizing uh, national needs? Well, I would say that, uh, first of all, with a, a relatively light uh, governance uh, structure in Rogeo, we create uh, what we call uh, in the Commission uh, jargon uh, high-level uh, expert uh, group that brings together uh, uh, the entire European uh, caucus, so with all the European members of uh, Rogeo, and uh, we, disc we meet uh, several uh, times uh, every year, and uh, we discuss and, and uh, co-create uh, together the, the Rogeo uh, work program. There are then different uh, calls and mechanisms and tools to implement uh, Eurogeo, and that uh, like the Horizon uh, 2020 uh, programs and all those uh, countries and members uh, can participate uh, in those uh, calls. Then there is um, a question that uh, is of interest to all the speakers. It comes from uh, Kentaro Ando. Regional Geo have an av advantage to access to in situ Earth observation data in uh, in their uh, respective regions. Any ideas about uh, how to make better use of those in situ uh, data uh, for geo in a region? And that's a question for all the speakers. So, if uh, Angelica or uh, Hiroyuki, uh, you can come with your views on that. Don't be shy. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, can you please repeat the, the question? Um, 
So regional geos have an advantage to access to in situ earth observation data in a region. NAID is about better use of in situ data for geo in a region. I, I think that um, it could be. However, I, I believe that the best um, way to access any, any type of data is, you know, you need to make the activities to be a win-win situation uh, for, both, for both parts, not only the recipient, but also who's providing the, the data. Um, so I would say that the regional re geos can facilitate that, but it's only, you know, when the activities of the thematic, um, of thematic nature uh, have some type of service so that it, it can be a, a win-win, so mainly for the person or, or the institution that is providing the data. Um, Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you, Angelica. I'm afraid that it will be difficult to take uh, other questions uh, as we have to close in uh, five minutes from now. Um, I would like anyway to recall all the participants that even if their questions were not addressed uh, during the session, we will keep the slide open and we will um, try to reply uh, to each of the, the, the questions in the in the coming days, either via Slido or directly by uh, by email. Um, now that we are coming to uh, close to the end of the session, as a facilitator, I would like to catch uh, this opportunity to just list a few takeaway uh, messages that I have uh, captured from our uh, discussions. So I think that now uh, we are in a situation where regional geos are now well placed in the geo landscape and the presentation you have seen have uh, demonstrated, I believe, uh, their unique benefits and specificities. Bringing the regional assets to the entire geo community uh, remain, of course, a challenge. But uh, numerous examples of collaborations between the regional geo and the geo flagships and initiatives confirm the added value of the regional approach. Uh, I notice as well that the benefits exist in uh, both directions, downscaling geo activities to specific uh, regions and contexts, or bringing local and regional knowledge to the intention of the geo community. And that's where I think that uh, maybe, uh, and it's a proposal uh, I would make to the geo secretary and to the entire community, is I think that it would be uh, nice to 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 include a, a mechanism to consult the regional geo in the drafting of each uh, flagships and an initiative so they could provide their input uh, provide a way they could uh, collaborate contribute and make uh, better use of uh, of the knowledge that is generated in each uh, flagship or initiative or community activity of uh, geo I note as well that uh, regional geo are often uh, able to act as uh, facilitators to touch base uh, regional and local stakeholders, much better than if uh, those uh, approach were driven from outside the region. Uh, even uh, international initiatives, as uh, sometimes their uh, lo local uh, chapter like UNGGIM, and uh, those local chapters uh, are certainly better approach if they are approach by people that know from the region and know the the, the region uh, challenge. Among the examples that were shown uh, today, uh, many demonstrate that uh, shared local data and knowledge contribute to the global endeavor while responding to local priorities, challenge and needs. And uh, this is something I would like as well to, to, to as a takeaway uh, message when we consider the future architecture and the evolution of the geos uh, infrastructure, I think that uh, regional geo will be a key data information and knowledge uh, providers, but they will, be as, they will be as well a consumer of those information. So this is the end of this uh, session. Before closing the session, let me remind you that the next uh, geo symposium session uh, 
session 10 on integrating water and coastal data set will start in uh, exactly one hour from now at uh, 3.30 p.m. Uh, CEST. And with this, I would like to close the session and thank you for your attention. And uh, of course, my thanks go as well to the Geo Secretariat and the Geo Symposium Working Group. And of course, uh, the, my uh, uh, speakers that uh, have all helped uh, tremendously setting up uh, everything and maintain the momentum in uh, this particular difficult uh, period. Have a great day uh, wherever you are and uh, goodbye. Thank you.